everybody have a good Christmas? Oh, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. If you're like me, it'll, 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 he'll back over here. It'll, it'll go on for a while. I think I got one today. Then I got one in about three weeks and and stuff. Yeah, yeah. We're spread out. Yeah. <laughs> Cause, cause of COVID up there, we had to cancel up there, but, but it, was, it was good. It was good up there. God's so good. Uh, get to visit with people we haven't seen, friends come in, uh, which I know this is church appropriate, but it's a uh, uh, saw sheriff deputy said, wow, I just love Christmas. It's easy to catch the people with all the warrants because they're at their parents' house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it was funny though. I had to admit, he's in the fire department with me, so he, it was it was funny. It was funny out there. But good to see everybody, because people I haven't seen in a while up there. We got a whole bunch of Flanagan. We got Flanagan Epstein Road, Epstein Road right there in the back. But they're all sat in the back. Nobody wants to sit in the front as usual up there. But uh, but uh, what what a great time. What a great season. Wait, okay, we can start Ox here. Yeah. <laughs> uh oh. That's better. Y'all don't want y'all don't want the rock and roll guitar for this. <laughs> All right, well we're gonna do our our Scott Flanagan organized Christmas special we always do. Y'all are gonna have a sermon too, so we're gonna be here till two ish. So, uh, no, it's, it's it's all good. It's all good up there. So we're gonna sing a lot of Christmas carols and do kind of a little walk through the Christmas story. I don't know what Rob's preaching, and you never know. So up there, but, I, but he, he worked on it hard, and he always does. So, okay, we're going to get started. Hopefully, we've got it organized right. Let's stand. We're going to start off with a reading, right? We're going to start off. Scott's going to read something first. Okay, and our first song is going to be A Little Town of Bethlehem. Through seven. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. 
be registered with Mary, his betrothed, I'm sorry, his betrothed wife who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Okay, going to do Silent Night.
sing louder. I can hear myself. <laughs> All right, what child is this? <coughs> Grateful chorus raised we 
need a break or sit down, go ahead and have a seat. If you want to stand, you can. But Let's see if I can. Okay, I'll be reading uh, Luke 2, 8 through 14, if I can read it that far. Now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. One job, one job. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Okay, we're going to do Hark the Herald Angels Sing. <laughs> Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled, joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the sky. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Hail the heavenly born Prince of Peace, hail the Son of Righteousness. what we were going to sing, but I took that out. We'll sing it later. <laughs> there. And then we Luke 2, 15. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see the thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph. shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen and, and was told to them. In the first Noel. The first Noel.
next one again. <laughs> I think I would fire me if I were y'all. <laughs> no, no, okay. Nope. You have to go all the way to the end and then go back. I fixed the I f fixed the paper. I just didn't fix the slides. <laughs> that one. <laughs> then not that one. We'll go back to the previous one. <laughs> All right, I'm going George the World Medley. Almost done. <laughs> that little reminder that he was here okay we're gonna end up with oh come all you faithful when she gets back to it there you go oh come all you faithful let's get us a chord you ready, ready? no it's not on there no <laughs> it's not on there acapella <laughs> Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him. Born the 
King of Angels, oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Christ the Sing choirs of angels, sing in exaltation, sing all ye citizens of heaven above. Glory to God, glory Father, we thank you so much that we can come together and worship you freely. Lord, so many of you are celebrating, quote, Christmas and don't realize what it's about. Don't realize that from the very first word of the Bible up there, Jesus was already there. He didn't just appear so many years later, he's always been. Well, we thank you so much that we can come together and worship you. We do celebrate your birthday, but we know it's, it's about the cross and the sacrifice, your death upon that horrible cross, your resurrection, arising on the third day, ascending into heaven, sitting at God's right hand, interceding for each and every one of us. You took on every sin, every, every bad word, every bad deed, every failure we have, you took upon yourself upon that cross. And that is amazing. Past, present, and future. We cannot fathom that. But here we are celebrating your birth. What a joyous occasion that God sent a Savior down to this earth. Live, live as a man. Show us how to live. What an awesome God that he wanted that relationship with us. And so, Lord, forgive us when we get caught up in the, the rush of this season. Help us always to remember what it's truly about. It's always about Jesus. Anything and everything, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's all about him. We thank you and we love you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
since Ken themes seems to think that the time is of no uh, of no value this morning, I'm going to dis I'm going to uh, read the uh, 115 119th Psalms, Rob, <laughs> so that you won't have to say too much this morning. I have selected a psalm that goes uh, something like this in Psalm number 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foes and their avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man, you care for him. You made him a little lower than the hev heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the worlds of, his, of your hand. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and all the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and all that swim in the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. Father, we thank you for your creation. We thank you, Father, what you have given to us. And we thank you, dear Father, for all that you provide, not only today, but for the fact that you are the majestic one, the majestic one of all the earth. You have created all life and all beings. And we thank you, Father, for the fact that you have given us an opportunity to take partake of your salvation. Thank you for your love, and we thank you, Father, for your Son who died on the cross and was raised up on the third day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do I need to start over? It really is going to be 2 o'clock before we get out of here. <laughs> Thank you. So the invitation was for pastors to gather to learn to preach, to, God, to preach God's word with some relevance to the world in which we live in. Because I'm going to show you a passage this morning that was written uh, 2,000 years ago to a church in Macedonia. To a church that would be recognized as a Roman colony, that we have been gathering ourselves in this place for the last few months, talking about that church at Philippi, and I don't have to stretch one single verse this morning to preach with relevance about where we're at in America. I don't need to go to a seminary, I don't need to go to a seminar, I don't need to go to a teaching from somebody to teach us this morning from God's word, what is it to live life in view of where we live right now in the Western world. It's not a matter of me trying to be relevant to God's Word. God's Word is relevant in any age. It was before the beginning of time, and it will be in eternity in the future. There's absolutely nothing I can do to change that. I don't want to change that. But because of that, what can we learn from the passage today about where we live and about how we're to live in view of the passage that Paul wants the church at Philippi to squarely line up in? 
He has been talking for the last several verses, all the way back to chapter 1, verse 27, kind of in a broad sense of how Christians ought to conduct themselves in the world in which they live at Philippi. He uses broad terms, and so we're going to reflect on that a little bit this morning, but he gets real bottlenecked on this passage. He gets extremely personal. Now, if you're one of those that don't uh, really like the personal aspect of God's word, this may be a little bit uncomfortable for you because it was for me when I studied it the last few weeks. So I get it many times from the place that I study in our home and my feet are really sore because I feel like the Holy Spirit is standing on my feet. He's marching on my toes. Because this is where I live and if you're gonna ask me, Rob, do you have struggles in your Christian life? I do and some of them are in this passage. But I dare say that I'm not the only one in this room that is going to look at this passage and say, man, I struggle with that too, Rob. How then shall I live in my life exemplary as a believer, but with the lens by which I view life through the exaltation of Jesus Christ? Remember, that's how we got into this passage. Christ exalted, then how shall I live? If Christ is truly Lord, and God has made him that, God has called him. God has granted for us to be in right relationship with him. He is the exalted king of kings. And I'm to live life through that lens. Not my circumstances driving me, good or bad. Not the relationships that I have, good or bad. Not that I I don't cherish those relationships with my family and with you guys. That's not the point. I don't live my life with the lens by which if something good happens to me, then I'm happy. When it's bad, then I'm sad. That's not the purpose of the life of the Christian. Because guys, if that was the case, we'd be on a roller coaster and we would be really marred by our own circumstances in an up and down ebb and flow. Every day it changes. But God is never changing. He's always the same. The immutability of God drives us to a different place in our mind. Then how shall I live in the midst of relationships and circumstances? Yeah, how should my demeanor then be? Well, Paul knows the church at Philippi is probably as well as the church at Philippi knows themselves. Ten years he's labored in the field, whether they're presently or hearing from them or just getting word back from someone. They've even sent love offering. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time in 17 and 18 this morning because we're going to refer back to when we get to chapter 4. In verse 18, there was a love offering, a sacrificial giving, and Paul talks about that being a sacrifice of praise. And so we're going to look at Paul's life in just a few months, uh, maybe maybe next year sometime, uh, maybe toward the end when I get to chapter 4. But we're going to look at that that sacrificial giving in in lieu of Paul's life and in, in lieu of their generosity and what that means in the life of the believer. But guys, you realize verses 14 through 16 is one sentence. Now that's like Paul, isn't it? Just one continual sentence. He doesn't know that a comma is not a period, I think. And sometimes he just gets carried away and just keeps adding a comma and they just keep marching. And he always does this in summary or in conclusion. Guys, don't be fooled by that. That's like any good pastor that you've ever taught, heard teach. In closing, it could be another 45 minutes after that. So this is a statement of conclusion, but it's not all that Paul's going to have to say. He's got a lot more to say. He has two more whole chapters to say it. But there's some conclusion spots that we need to come to. There's some some foundational teaching that here at the church in Ballinger, we need to land on. And we need to take to heart what he's saying. Because it matters how we live. And I know a lot of people will leave here in just a few minutes and having gone through the reading of God's word and the preaching of God's word and you'll want to live your life however you want to and it won't look anything like this. That's not for us in Christ. So please, let the passage speak to you this morning. Beginning in verse 12 is where we're going to put it back in context of chapter 2 and and deal with 14 through 18. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, But now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work, 
uh, <coughs> both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may have cause to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain in verse 17 but even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith I rejoice <coughs> wow, and share my joy with you all verse 18 and in conclusion and you too I urge you rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me father i thank you for this time as we get to journey into your word for just a a a time this morning that father we would be shaped by it since it is in context the sanctification of our own life to the image of your son jesus christ find us faithful in christian conduct father we're going to confess to you this morning that we can't do this absolutely cannot do this outside of you it's not about a work that we're being called to this morning in human effort. It's about a call that only you can pull off. But Father, find us blameless, innocent Father, of those things that would contaminate us in this world. We love you. We consider this day a day to serve. Find us faithful. If you're taking notes this morning, I want to direct your attention since I'm going to let you just write it down and get it out of the way so that we can just fly through this. It is a culmination of lots of things that Paul has already said in verses 14 through 15a. In that first part of the sentence, he is going to deal with our walk, our manner of lifestyle, our habits. He's going to say, this is, this is what I don't want you to walk like, but this is how I want you to walk. So he first gives them a restraint. I want you to restrain to live this way. And so he's going to make it very clear what that is. Secondly, he's going to talk about their reputation or their testimony. I don't want you to live like this, but I want you to live like this. And so that's 14 through the beginning of 15. Then he kind of changes gears for just a, 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 a small piece. And he's going to go in, in this last part of 15 through 16, their spiritual witness. And he's going to categorize it in three ways. Their testimony, their witness, their opportunity to share, and their opportunity to serve. And then he gives a summary statement about sharing his joy, and in return, he wants their joy being shared with him. Well, what is it that he's asking them to refrain from or to restrain themselves to? We know that this, in particular, is dealing with our sanctification. He says, I want you to work out your salvation. He does not say work for Let's make that clear again. Well, what is it about sanctification? What is sanctification anyway? I I would dare say that we use lots of terminology in church, and we walk out and say, man, I think that was a good message, but I don't have a clue what that guy was talking about because I don't know what that word sanctification means. Sanctification is a call to holiness, a call to be set apart, not just to be set apart for the sake of being put on the shelf, but set apart from the world to Christ Jesus. What does that look like? I want you to, in your mind, and I think we have it on the screen, look at the screen for just a second, begin to form these understandings. What is sanctification? What is it that we're to work out? And it is God's power and his will in our life to do this. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, the scripture says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be, what? Sanctification, conformed to the image of his Son so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So by definition, sanctification, being set apart, a call to holiness, is conformity to the image of God. I do lots of artwork. It's one of my favorite things to do. And one of the things that artists kind of get uh, in a trap to if they're going to do something very quickly. So I do lots of commission pieces, and somebody will say, hey, can I have it next month? They don't understand art when they ask me to do that. Oil on canvas is not a one-month event for me. Maybe I'm slow. Maybe I don't know how to do it. Maybe I, I'm just not very uh, successful at it, and I'm just inept. I can't do it in a month. But those are the times I have to almost cast up on the screen or up on my canvas, and I have to take some rough tracings of what I'm going to do, whether it's a horse or a deer or whatever, so that I then can start putting on, on the canvas the paint that's going to make that come alive. I don't like to do it that way, but sometimes time just 
It requires me to do that. Do you know what the Apostle Paul is asking the church at Rome to do? Get in the boundary, the shape of Christ. That's sanctification. Don't try to be go rogue. Don't try to be Mr. Independent or Miss Independent. I want you to look just like the one who saved you. And that was a work that was taking place long before one foundational stone was laid. Justification then immediately leads us into a life of progression. In this life, we will never be fully sanctified. But in that process, that's what we yearn. That's what we desire to be. Conformed to the image of the Son. Guys, you know that every single day, I want to look more like Christ than me than the day before. Did you know that's the will of God too? He looked at the church at Thessalonica and he says, hey, you want to know God's will? Oh, yeah, 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 I want to know God's will. Your sanctification is God's will. Folks, nobody wants it more than God. I was looking at families, and I, I'm telling you, I, I told Alan when I saw their lovely daughter walk in, you can't deny her. I'm not saying because she's not worthy of love. That's not what I'm saying. She resembles her mom and dad. I could have without any, any explanation or uh, any introduction, I could have walked into church this morning and I would have said, okay, that's a family, that's a family, that's a family, you get it? That's a family. And I don't know anything about you. But I can look at that conforming image and I know somewhat of who you are. Folks, how does the world view us? Only by word? Am I a follower of Christ? Or do I look like him? Do I act like him? Do I talk like him? Are my mannerisms in keeping with who he is in character? Folks, you know that can't happen without his abiding spirit within me it's his will for me but listen it can't happen and we're going to see unless i take the commanded word of god and i humble myself before it and i say god whatever you want that's what i want i desire only what you want for me so sanctification is the image of christ being played out in the life of the believer but how and what? I think we need to answer those questions. So in John chapter 17, Jesus begins to speak, and he's in a very difficult situation. His life is fixing to be required of him in sacrifice, and it is a sacrifice by which we now exist as believers. He says this to the Father. In 17, 17 of John, he says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Look at verse 19. For their sakes I sanctify myself, I conform myself to the will of God, that they themselves also may be sanctified in what? What's the agency? What is the very piece that God uses to sanctify the believer? The truth. Well, what is the truth? Thy word is truth. Folks, you will not be sanctified in a get well quick book. Go to a Christian bookstore and it'll blow your mind. Shelf after shelf after shelf is how to have a happy marriage and how to be a great teenager and how to live your life for the fullness and how to have your best life now. Folks, this is your life. This is who we are. You don't need seven steps to a healthy, healthy marriage. My goodness, get into God's word. It's healthy for your marriage. When, I raised the, when we raised the boys, I didn't go to a self-help book to determine what's best for my sons and what's best for my daughter. It's right here. Why don't we live it? Do we believe it? So sanctification is the will of God and the agency by which he sanctifies us or conforms us is his truth, his word. Go to 1 Thessalonians, uh, well it's going to be on the board for you so you don't have to turn. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. Now, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete. And this is what it looks like. 
without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus. When I'm standing at the Bema seat of Christ, judgment for reward, I want to be known as his kid. Not because I've just said it, because I look like him. Folks, if my dad walked in right now, I would be the testimony of everybody in this room, just like your family. He could be right back there in the corner, not associated with my family. You say, oh, well, that's, that's Rob's dad. Why? Because he looks just like him. Second Thessalonians, in chapter 2 and verse 13. But we should always give thanks to God for you. Brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. He sums up all that he has said about sanctification. It is of God. It is his image. It is through his truth. It is the work of the Spirit in you, and it drives us to the Word. And the Word shapes our character. Well, that in a nutshell is what we're looking at this morning. He starts with a restraint. Look at verse 14 very quickly as we look at the walk. Again, I want to remind you that these are present imperative uh, commands. Uh, They are written in an active voice. We are participants. We are to participate. He says this in 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. (laughs) Man, here's where I live. Guys, on any given day, I can find something to gripe about. Yeah, and more times than not, it's because I think I could have done it better. Yeah, so it's a pride thing with me. Oh, I can't believe that. That's the product they're going to put out? <laughs> we could do that, right? So he takes the church at Philippi and he says, hey, if I'm just going to take you guys right here at Philippi and I'm going to put you right into that conformity to the image of God, here's some things that you're going to have to let go of. Quit whining. It's literally what it means to murmur with a low voice. It means like you go to the corner of the room and you go, hey, they're not standing on a soapbox at least and going, that pastor really stinks. They're just going, that pastor stinks as they're eating their chicken at lunch over the pastor. Right? That's what he's saying. Look, I know that life is going to be difficult. I know that this conformity is going to be challenging. And I know sometimes to get within that tracing, it's going to cost you to let go of something. Here's what I'm going to ask you to let go of. Quit grumbling. Quit murmuring. Quit crying about your plight in life. Did you know that God has you exactly where he wants you? And to think otherwise is to call God's sovereignty into question, is it not? If I said to go to work at the service center, come next Monday, a week from tomorrow, and I have to put up with one more superintendent that doesn't do it the way Rob wishes he would would do it, and I'm going to go in my car and I'm going to gripe all the way home with windshield time with whoever's riding with me. Man, that school district would be a lot better if, and I get to tell them what if means. Did you know we do it right here in the church? I told you guys a few weeks ago about a pastor friend of mine just on the, remember that? Just on the field, brand spanking new, just got his family moved in, his wife, his precious kids. And why in the world the secretary would ask him to pick the color of the paint for his office in the foyer? I don't know. You already know you're in trouble when you're picking paint by yourself, especially men. (laughs) Pastor, I think it'd be great if you'd, Pick the color of the paint for your own office. And while you're at it, let's paint the foyer the same color. Yeah, Wednesday night, prayer meeting slash business meeting. Wow, what a combination, huh? Grumbling. Who picked the paint? He's sitting on the front pew, brand spanking new. Surprise, I picked. That color? What does that go with? Uh, no, seriously. Who picked the paint? And this guy asked the sheep, was to go? I did. And we get caught up 
in junk like that. In these low tone murmurings. In disputes over things that don't matter. He says, I'm going to call you to restrain. Do all things. That's pos. Without exception. Everything in your life. Would you just do this one thing as a commandment? Be active in this one thing. Do not grumble or dispute the things that's going on in your life. Now theologians are going to argue this point. From the viewpoint, is he talking about grumbling and disputing against God or against people? I'm going to tell you right now, who cares? It's all the same. When I grumble about my circumstance with people, I'm calling God's sovereignty into question. When I grumble toward God about something that he has placed me in or some, uh, s- some matter of life that he's going to call me to, it's still calling his sovereignty into question. So I'm going to tell you a good dose for Ballinger Church this morning is that we restrain from murmuring, grumbling, and disputing over things that don't matter. And I'm included. Guys, there's probably no telling how many meals after church I've been baked and cooked over. 19 years in the ministry, I bet you 10 to 1, at least one meal, I was the focus of the meal. And it wasn't for my good pleasure. But I never got a call. I never got an extension of any grace. I just got talked about. Roman colony. They're Christians. Things are not going to go well. The Apostle Paul is writing this with a dim lit room probably dictating this to somebody that is scribing writing this down he is in prison not going all that great and if he can say without equivocating quit griping about your plight in life Paul could say it because you see in 17 and 18 he really believes this could be the end for him I am presently being poured out on the sacrificial table as a libation of sacrifice. This could be it. Now we know it's not because we have the rest of the story. But the next time he's arrested, off with your head. He did die a martyr's death. Folks, I don't know anybody in this room that's going to walk out of here and in your walk today, your life is going to be required of you. What do we have to gripe about? Guys, I ate so many calories yesterday of good food. I am for, I, I'm good for a week. Not really. By 2 o'clock I'll be eating. But <laughs> Guys, God has been so good to us. Just think about your life. I'm looking at families. Really? He said, don't grumble. Don't have disputes among you. But then he gets off of that really quickly and he starts telling us something. How should we live? Francis Schaeffer asked this years ago. Look at verse 15. That you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. That you may authenticate yourself and it's going to look like you are not tainted by the world. You're not fractured by the world. You're sincerely innocent in the sight of God. So you have an outward picture that's blameless. The world is going to see your testimony as being blameless, above repute. I don't have anything that I can hold against this brother or sister. When they say something, you can take it to the bank. Did you know that when when I was a kid growing up on on a ranch, my dad sold hay because our lower fields we had alfalfa and so whatever we had to feed we took from the first cutting or or from the first fruits and then all of the the horse farms in the area because I lived outside of Rio Dosa where there's just tons of uh, horse racing endeavor and so there's lots of hay they're trying to be purchased and they want good alfalfa hay did you know he never made a single contract outside of a handshake and his word. That's blameless. When the world would look at my dad, they would say, hey, just call Richard if he has any. He'll be fair to you. 
And if he says it will be delivered at such and such a time and it will be this amount of tonnage, it will be. Pull it on the scale. So one morning, my brother and I are getting the same talk that my dad always gave us before we delivered hay in Rio Dosa down at the racetrack. Go slow around the corners. Well, there's a corner every five feet. We're going to creep all the way to Rio Dosa from the ranch. No, we're teenage boys. We're going to drive as hard as we can, as fast as we can, and we're going to try to keep it at least on two wheels. Uh, one would be not very optional, and laying on the side would not be good at all. We dump the hay in the bar ditch right on the side of the road. Guys, this is before cell phones, okay? So please don't say, hey, did you just call your dad on your cell phone? Yeah, we stood on top of the hill and just threw our head back and said, we wrecked. So we have a whole load of hay laying in the ditch. Somebody's got to tell my dad that, okay? Not going to be a happy camper. Go to the local mercantile. Finally walked about two, two miles from where we rolled the hay. Called my dad, picked it up. He's in the barn, picked it up. In the tack room. What's going on? Well, he knows it's bad, okay? Who, we hadn't been gone 30 minutes. We couldn't have been there to deliver. Hey, everything went great, got the money. 30 minutes. We couldn't get there in 30 minutes, even if we drove like maniacs. And we were trying everything we could to dump that hay, and we did. What happened? We dumped the hay. I told you guys to go slow. Come get another load. He had to dip from his first fruit cuts called the man at the barn the stables boys are going to be a little bit late I'm sorry I'll take X amount off because we didn't meet our time we delivered the second load we went and forked the first load into a trailer yeah my dad didn't help with any of this by the way And my older brother had the audacity to say at dinner, why'd you do that? Why don't you just catch him on the next round of cutting? Because I told him I would deliver to him so many tons of hay. It's my name on the line. Philippi. Don't murmur and don't grumble about your plot in life. Don't be distorted with this world. Be blameless. And then he uses a word for innocence. One is an outward view, blameless. The other is inward. Your inner man is at peace. It's innocent. It's without defilement. Did you know I don't think that guy ever missed a minute's sleep when he laid his head on his pillow? Because he never had to apologize for breaking his word. What about us? We say we're this, but then we act like that. Paul says, no, those things should not be that way. But then he carries on. He says, you're blameless and innocent. And then he gives them the definition of why. Children of God. You're birthed from God. You're God's kid. Children of God, above reproach, that's above just the minimal standard. You're above that. And then he says, because you live in a perverse and crooked generation. You live in a generation that is bent away from God and is twisted in their thinking. There's the relevancy part if you're trying to tune in. Folks, that's America right now. We have taken what God's word has said and we've tried to legalize it and make laws anti to God's scripture and then we wonder why we're under judgment. Really? Did I tell you the rest of the story when we dumped the hay? I took a spanking. I'm 16 years old. And you know what? I gladly took it and if my dad walked around and was going to bust me, I'd bend over and let him bust me because he has always proven himself to be right in handling me. And in all in reference, I respect his authority. And God's authority is right here. Quit asking if God's going to change his mind on homosexuality. He is not. If God is going to change his mind on gender specificity. He is not. He is not going to change his definition of what a marriage is. One man, one woman for life. He's not changing his mind. 
And we live in a perverse and a crooked generation that would love for Christians to put a stamp of approval on everything they're doing. And we cannot and be blameless and innocent in the sight of God. And I want to just tell you something. I don't care what you think about me. But I care what God thinks about me. And one day, I'm going to stand approved or disapproved by Him. That's the one that matters to me. And for what I teach, I will stand in judgment for. And how I live, I will stand in judgment for. And the words that come out of my mouth, I will give an account for. And I don't care about what men think about me. I used to. And I was miserable. And maybe it's just old age and graying in the temple and just getting fat around the middle. But guys, I don't really care anymore what you think. God, find me faithful. Man, just find me right with you. Because there's a crooked world out there. There's a world that's been away from you. And in every way, it is twisted in its thinking. I live there. So does the church at Philippi. Don't be shocked if you have opponents. It's a sign of their destruction. Remember that in 28 of chapter 1? They don't get out of this thing alive. You take care of your character and your conduct. You stand up, pay attention, and do what I ask you. That's what matters to me. Well, there's a reason for this, and I want you to see it. He says that there's a perverse and... Uh, crooked generation he says among whom you appear as lights in the world you, you, you see that he says you're not of the world but you're in it you say well, really where do you get that look at it he says that you are in this crooked and perversion among whom you appear luminary as light so Rob what does that mean guys have you ever been to a large concert or a large gathering of people and there's just people all around you and you're, you're an individual or you're Rob and you're not so and so next to you in fact you don't even know that person next to you but you're in the midst of all those but you're still Rob that's this word no matter what setting I'm in I'm still a child of God I appear in the midst of them. Well, what, what do I look like? I look like a beacon of hope. As dark as crooked and perverted looks like, is as wholly unnatural as that would be for the believer. That is their nature. That is their tendency. That's who they are. They're a dark people. And he said, guess what, Rob? Quick griping about it. You know where I have you? Right in the middle of them. Why? So that you can show forth the glory of God in how you live. Conform to the image of his son. You know what God's fixing to do in America? Turn up the light. He is calling out his people. I believe it with all of my heart. This Generation X stuff, that's garbage. I see young people like never before. Guys, I've been in this thing for 40 years. I, Rodney and I have a lot of the same similarities in, in Delphi and those of you who have come out of the school system. This is my 41st year in public education. There's a generation of young people that have a heart for God. He is calling out a generation of people. For what purpose? To be a light to the generation. He's taking old guys like me and giving me purpose. Why? Because he slapped me right here in the western world in America that thinks it's okay to sin and never be held accountable. And he says, Rob, would you just show yourself accountable to me? That they might have hope. Because you may be the only light they will ever see. Show them to me. Take them to me. I'll do a change that only I can do. Folks, not one time in this passage does it say that you are to change this crooked and perverse generation. It does not say that. It says you live in the midst of it as a light. Guys, I can't change anybody's heart. But I know where I can take them. I can take them right to the throne of grace. 
say, God, please be merciful. Change them. So he says, you're light. In the midst of all of this darkness, you're to be light. Right, so how? Look at it. He says, among you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life. So my outward testimony is I'm walking in step with Christ, conformed to his image, and then what am I supposed to do? Testify with the life I live and the words I speak. He says, I want you to hold fast the word of life. I want you to tell them the truth about me and I want you to use my word to do it. Guys, you know, let me tell you the really the cool thing about preaching. You know, when I go do uh, superintendents conferences and all this kind of stuff and we're doing all these federal compliance and uh, stuff that sometimes I just shake my head going, man, well, how did we get here? Uh, we must have got off the road somewhere. <laughs> we need to get back. I constantly have to kind of reform myself and rethink and have to come up with these hooks and tricky things to get uh, the attention of those that are listening. Did you know that I've, if I stick to the word of God, I've never written a single message? You say, oh, Rob, come on. If I stick to the word, I, I, don't write, I don't write this. I've never written a single message. I just tell the message that's already been given to me. So do you. You've given but one life to live. How will you live it? And you've been given one message that brings hope. What will you share? He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be light in the midst of all that crookedness. But man, would you just share my word? To hold out, to offer. Here's the truth. Would you believe? Well, it gets better. He says, you're in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation and you appear as lights to the world and you're to hold fast the word. And then he says this, so that in the day of Christ... The beam of seat when I stand before him in judgment of reward, not in condemnation. That's a whole different judgment. That's great white throne. I'm not going to be there. He says, but I, on that day of Christ, I, the Apostle Paul, may have cause to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. He said, man, you know the greatest testimony for me is I would be right in line behind you guys. All the church at Philippi, Lydia, seller of purple, would be in line with you. Little slave girl, demon possessed, set free by the grace of God. I'm gonna be right behind you, honey. Philippian jailer and all of his family, I'm gonna be in line right behind you and all of your family. And I wanna hear one by one, well done, my good and faithful servant. Man, that would be life to me. I will know that I didn't suit up and run in an unworthy manner and that your testimony was not availed in Christ in righteousness. It was a wasted shot. I don't want it to be like that. I want to run this race and I want to fight these battles because I want you to know I live this life just like you. But one of these days, we're all going to stand at the throne. And we're going to hear something. Well done. Come on. There's your inheritance. And it's not a house built with by men. Hans, I'm sure you're a great builder. But I don't want you building my heavenly home. There's nothing against you, brother. I want the carpenter from Nazareth to build my house. Never have to flush the plumbing. Never have to upgrade electricity. Never have to redo a roof. Man, what a day of rejoicing. But can I tell you, that's not what makes it special. Seated right in the center of the city to be praised and revered forever is one who bears the marks and his wrist, and his feet, and across the crown of his head, and in his pierced side. The carpenter calls me home. 
I, I, I want to hear that from you. As much as I love my dad saying, man, Rob, that a boy. You know what? I get over that pretty quick. I forget it. You will never get over it in heaven. It will always be ever before us. Here's the prize of life. Here's what the journey was all about. Because he uses terminology that the Greek world, the Roman world, would understand. To run in vain, to labor in vain. Guess what they would do? They had long races like Colton. He runs half marathons and preparing to run marathons. All this kind of stuff. They ran long races like that. Several miles. And it would start inside the stadium and the stadium would be full of people. The Colosseum would be packed with people. They would start the race inside the Colosseum. They would run out of the end of the Colosseum and then you wouldn't see them for a few hours. Sounds like fun, right? And then all of a sudden, somebody at the top would begin to cheer. And you knew the first runner had been spied and spotted. And he had come back in the Colosseum in front of all of those witnesses. And he would, in his gallant effort, be declared the winner. And a wreath would be put around his neck, and he would from then on be known. He ran his race well. He did not run in vain. I said, man, that's me. I want to come back in the stadium one day where they're just packed with brothers and sisters. And know that Christ overcame even me. I didn't grumble. I didn't murmur. I didn't whine. I stood in the midst of a perverse and crooked generation. And I was the light and I extended to them the word of God. For those who would call upon the mighty name of God, he would save them. And that's all a work of his amazing grace. And he says, even though I may be poured out as a libation, a sacrifice, an offering. Even though they, if this is it. Let's just say I get word tomorrow and they say, hey, Paul, you, you got your audience uh, ready? You've got your defense ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Well, Caesar will see you now. And at the end of your whole defense, he says, you know, off with your head. It's okay. I just want you to know that I wanted to live my life in a place that you would be joy-filled. As a result, oh, and by the way, in 18, you know what you could do for me? Live your life that way so that I get a little joy out of you. Folks, this is the koinia. This is how the fellowship of the body works. Yeah. When one of you celebrates victory in Christ, we all rejoice. We all arrive it's a family of Christ that matters conformed to the image of his son for the joy of his being that we might with righteousness praise his name forever so what were the three characteristics again humility submission and obedience I want to stand humble before God I want to submit my life totally to him and whatever he asks me to do I want to obey Father find us faithful God, we thank you for the day. Thank you for your loving kindness toward us and for your word that is richly (coughs) laid out for us right here of how we should live. Father, our Christian conduct is truly that. As followers of you, would we be found faithful in the conformity of the image that is most special in your sight. Satisfy yourself, Father, in your Son, in your Son in us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So several years ago, I was speaking at a conference, and it was a black tie affair. And um, being from eastern New Mexico and West Texas, we don't do that very often, and so uh, it's kind of cool. And uh, they had some service pins to give out and some accolades uh, within the organization that I was speaking on behalf of. And they had me seated at the head table, and the crowd's out here, and we're seated across the table on this side. And podium's here and I'm like one person away and the guy that's going to introduce me sitting next to me and they get through all of that and the lights go dim in fact they go off from one spotlight spotlighting the podium so he gets up and he introduces me and he says things about me I didn't even know about me and 
uh, I'm like, I, am I the right guy that you brought in here? And so I get up there and I have to apologize uh, for his overstepping. And, and so, you know, everybody's got a big laugh. And I look down and I'm going to open my notes like this. And I didn't notice something when I was sitting over in the dark. I spilled some of my food. I have a white shirt on. And I look down and I have a yellow streak. Guys, I don't think I'm a coward, but it sure looked like it on that day. And it was in that place that, you know, you couldn't pull your lapel over. It was just like out of its reach and you tried to and it kind of highlighted it. But then if you just went full on and just let it go, it just looked like somebody, you know, hey, there's the target. Go ahead and shoot him, put him up, put us out of our misery. I had to live it. I just had to take full responsibility for being a sloppy eater and I just had to live it. I just had to take it. You know, my younger walk as a believer, I kind of stayed on the fringe and between that dark part and that light part. Kind of walked the edge. The closer I get to God and the more I know Him, the more my sin stands out and disgusts me. His righteousness just looks clearer and clearer to me than ever before, and I don't like it when I've got a spot on my shirt. Paul says, look, I, uh, I put you right in the center as light. And some of you are looking down at your shirt and you're going, man, I sure whine a bunch. I sure cry about my life a bunch and I sure throw people under the bus as though I know better. And he says, listen, you know what takes that away? Quit whining. And so I think I did the whole speech like this holding my lapel. Yeah. All proper. I tried to hide it. But even that, I couldn't hide it. Folks, what kind of church are we? And what should we be? Wherever you're at, that's exactly where God wants you. Be light. Extend the word. Let's grow up. It's not going to get better. That's not the promise. It will grow from bad to worse. But in the midst of it, man, we can kick the slats out and have a great time. We can be joy-filled in the midst of this. You believe that? I do. Thank you. God bless you.